This week on Theater Talk... If you want your minority group, for instance, to start seeming mainstream and not, capital D, different, first you've got to appear in movies, you've got to be in shows, you've got to be um, an amusing character in a sitcom, not a, <laughs> a sidekick. You've got to be one of the leads. Mm. That's what happened with gay. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, we've just come through a polarizing election Being in this country. Indeed. And there was a fascinating New York Times story a few weeks ago uh, about how a lot of the Tea Party candidates were using New York City in their ads as a symbol of a strange, uh, scary, awful kind of place where these fancy pants sophisticates live who really are not part of American culture. Uh, nothing new there. And in fact, that theme is in a fascinating new book called the Guest List, How Manhattan Defined American Sophistication from the Algonquin Round Table to Truman Capote's Ball. And it is by one of our great, great pals here on Theater Talk, Ethan Morden. Welcome back to Theater Talk. Thank you. Welcome back. Now, Ethan, when you read this time story I talked about, which said uh, these tea partiers were using New York as a symbol of something other and scary, you must have been happy to hear that since the book is, is all about that very subject. In, in fact, when I got the idea for the book and started researching it, the Tea Party did not exist. So it, it's it's funny that once again there's this uprising from the red states against the uh, coastal Babylons, shall we say, especially in New York. It happens periodically in the 20th century in American history. And why 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 does it happen? What does New York symbolize to people who don't like us? Well, on one level, it's immigrants. There are some people that just don't like different. People are different. They know about it. They don't really know a lot of people personally like that, but they know it's going on somewhere, and it's mainly going on in New York. There's also the idea that New York is the world's capital, well, at least the American capital of, of sin and crime and booze and being rude to your father and not going to church. It's that kind of thing. And there are people who live in a very narrow cultural compass. It's what the Italians call, I always have trouble with this word, campanalismo which means bell towerism. That is the, the bell tower on your church uh, in, in your parish. It's thinking like your parish. Everything that your parish thinks, you, you think. agree with. Everything else you are totally opposed to, sometimes on a homicidal level. It, it's also bound up with the idea of, of um, arcane people that no one knows the names of, quietly uh, tele te telepathically signaling each other in these boardrooms that no one knows about, moving money from bank to bank, country to country. Let's declare war. Let's, let's run some bonds. It's that kind of thing. So it's a resentment and a fear of a concentrated power in New York City. It's someone is changing my life, and I don't know who it is, but I'm mad at it. Although when you talk about moving the money around, I think there's truth to that, and I'm mad at it, too. Yes, <laughs> and we're, and we're New Yorkers. But one, of the, one of the reasons why it keeps coming back is there is some truth to it. Not, not about immigrants, not no, about no. different, right. but about Wall Street. Right. Wall Street, you know, has been an enemy of the red states for a long time. Charles Lindbergh the a aviator hero. Yeah. His father was a congressman, and his enemy was the House of Morgan. Yeah. That was the enemy of the world, the enemy of freedom, the enemy of America, the enemy of all mankind kind of thing. And all, of course, all these, these banking um, outfits are, are located in New York. So that's part of it. You know, this book is about the sophistication of New York as well. And is it not fair to say that perhaps New Yorkers themselves turn their noses up at the rest of the country? that there are, there are a bunch of backwoods people, not as sophisticated, not as intelligent as we are. And maybe the people in the red states feel that kind of snobbishness that comes from the New York sophisticates. I, I think some New Yorkers do feel that way, quite honestly. But I don't think the so-called bourgeoisie, which is what they're called, it's H.L. Mencken's term, yeah. I don't think they're aware of what New Yorkers, it, it, it's not as if they've really researched this. Hmm. I think my position is this. It's not like that at all. It's an instinctive it's anger at something, and they don't know what it is, but they think it's in New York. But of course now, you have the worldwide media. I mean, in the period of your book in the 20th century, this was not so much so, but now they can really see what they perceive as the elitist New York media espousing yes. values. People who are uh, feeling paranoid see that what, this, uh, what Fox News is helping them think is a, a left-wing media, and, and they're very upset about well, it. Well, it used to be that the word elite referred to 
the famous people that would turn up in a Cole Porter List song. They were yeah. movie stars, <laughs> yes. and, yeah, yeah. and they were people that wore those crazy costumes to nightclubs <laughs> and stayed up late. Yeah. Now, elite really is this dirty word. It's an angry derogation. The elites, actually, it's usually used in the plural, on, on say, Fox News or, or, or those various talk shows. The elites instantly conjures up, actually, um, I would say, instinctively, um, hate America first, it's that kind of thing. It's love the enemy, it's um, make kowtow to the enemy, it's appeasement. I mean, this is political as well as, as social mm -hmm. and sociological kind of thing. But the elites now are, in the red states, the enemy. Now let's talk, though, about what your book begins with, though, uh, when the elites were the names we read in Winchell's column, and they weren't necessarily hated by people. People no. loved to follow them. When did, and who was the person who really kind of put it together and promoted it, this notion of of the guest list, of New York's sophisticated society. When does it really come into being? Just before Winchell, there was a columnist named O.O. O. McIntyre. He's the one who created this whole thing. Mm -hmm. He was kind of a professional hayseed. He came from the Midwest, and he came to New York, and he had this column in which he would go to restaurants, and he'd give you the names of the famous people. They were all his friends, by the way, <laughs> that he had seen. And he's totally forgotten now, because his column lacked the one thing that Winchell put into this format, gossip. Mm -hmm. It's the gossip that made it interesting. Just this guy going to some restaurant and saying, I saw a name, 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 name. That's not very interesting. But if you read a column and it says, I was in the restaurant and I saw a name's wife <laughs> with right. name, right. that's a whole different ballgame. Or even, and he did this once, what Winchell said, such and such a gangster is going to be murdered tomorrow. And he was. That was crossing a line, by the way. Winchell was in a lot of trouble for that one. But that's, Winchell is where it all started. And it's funny because now Winchell is, among people like us, I suppose, he still, he represents something. But most Americans have no idea who Walter Winchell was. Well, he's got a bad name now for people who pay attention because he created this whole gossip machine that everyone turns their nose up at. But we all know everybody loves gossip. That's human yes, nature. Yes, it, 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 it goes both ways. You say, I, you know, it, it's beneath me. I, I, I read the, it's like I read Playboy for the interview kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, right. but, but basically it was Winchell who turned it all inside out. And in his day, which his prime would be 1930s, 1940s, he really was the most powerful person in America who was not the president. That's right. Yeah. Yes, that's the thing that's so fascinating, Michael Riedel, is that the power that a columnist for a newspaper can get and the I way <laughs> and the way people the way he could get information, the way that that suddenly became possible, coming from a place where you start in your book when it was unseemly for at least people in society to even have their names. It in was newspapers. unheard of. It's unheard right. of. Absolutely. You, not. you fast forward to Walter Winchell people just People, people live to be yeah. in his column then. Well, at, at first they didn't want to be, but then it became this kind of thing where you're not really famous unless you're in the column. Yeah. And of course there were other columns as well, so there was this whole infrastructure surrounding him. You couldn't get into Winchell, could you get into Ed Sullivan kind of thing. These people were very, very, very powerful. And how much was the sophisticated New York Winchell seeing it and, and, and just reporting on it, or Winchell creating it because his own power that he had to create these clubs, to create these people? Well, it, 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 it goes both ways, doesn't it? Because first you create the opportunity, and then at first people say, oh, I wouldn't be caught dead in that column. But then they see other people doing it, and they think, I'm not going to still be famous if I'm not on the column, too. And then they have to hire their PR person to plant an item in the column. Right. right. But also thing. isn't there the principle that if the columnist gets a hold of some information, that it's really not a good idea if you don't comment, if you withhold commentary to the column, that's all the worse for you. The, the point is, I think, it becomes so big that it's not just the column. It's larger than that. It becomes an American thing that's going on all the time. Like, if you ever watch old 30s movies, at least once in every Hollywood movie in the 1930s, Winchell gets mentioned somewhere or other. Yeah. It's that big. It, it's almost like Big Brother is watching you. It's kind of a friendly Big Brother, especially if you're not famous, because then you're not prey right. kind of thing. But, I mean, for instance, why would, um, in his column, if Winchell says, um, the up-and-coming singer name is wowing them at the um, plaza room, whatever it is. Now, would you, you and I wouldn't think, oh, I must go. But there are people who don't know where to go. Mm. And they think, if Winchell says so, then that must be where the, the bigwigs go. That's where you go. That's where it's happening. And that's, and suddenly the place is, you know, is jammed. And that's New York's sophistication of the era. Well, on a, to a certain extent. But on a higher, I'm sorry. Because there's also Cole Porter. I mean, there's also you, Truman yeah. Capote. Right. I mean, sophistication really means a mixture. And my point in this is that what I call New Yorkism is an ethnicity invented in New York made of 
the most interesting and useful and colorful and piquant sides to various minority group cultures, Irish, Italian, Jewish, black, and gay. Gay came in later, and the others are. And you mix it all together, and you take the parts that you like. For instance, the, uh, the kind of wisecracking New York humor, I think, is a mixture of 19th century Irish whimsy and a Jewish kind of forget about it kind of thing. It, it goes together, and it takes pieces of this, and it takes pieces of that. Ethel Waters breaks the color bar mm -hmm. permanently, because Burt Williams had come before her, but it didn't take. In the 1930s, Ethel Waters is really the first black star in otherwise all white shows. And then suddenly everyone says, well, let's all do this. Right. Whereas before, when Ziegfeld brought in Burt Williams, no one else wanted to do it. It was too early. And it's interesting, though, that, that Broadway is the place where these outsiders become mainstream for the world, right? When you make I, it on Broadway, then, then middle America is embracing and accepting those cultures. Not only that, I think minority groups, in order to get social power, political power, must make their first um, appearance, shall we say, in, in the mainstream in showbiz, because everything in America revolves around showbiz. So if you want your minority group, for instance, to start seeming mainstream and not, capital D, different, first you've got to appear in movies, you've got to be in shows, you've got to be um, an amusing character in a sitcom, not a, a sidekick, <laughs> you've got to be one of the leads. Mm. That's what happened with gay, actually, yeah. if you think about it moving up to Will and Grace and so on. Now gay is just an ordinary part. We see all these Republicans coming out, now, that, that was unheard of 20 years ago. Interesting. Uh, on a higher level than Winchell, though, and, and a key component of, of American, of New York sophistication was the Algonquin Round Table. Yes. Um, how did that come about? And were the round tablers showing off? Yes. They, at some point, did they realize yes. we're going to get a lot of ink in maybe in Winchell's column if we get around to say funny things? It's not, it's not even that. It's just... It, it, it's like you spend all morning rehearsing your anecdotes, rehearsing your, or you think of a great line, because sooner or later, Alexander Wolcott is gonna say, he's gonna pick up one of his latest book. He's brought it to the table. What is so rare as a Wolcott first edition? So you can say, a Wolcott second edition? <laughs> <laughs> and Edna Ferber, for instance, who was in the group, had to square off lunching at right. the Algonquin because it, she couldn't get any work done that way. <laughs> and you know, to a certain extent, a lot of people thought they were phonies and they were show-offs and they um, used their own column inches to tout each other's work and so on. But the, and, and there are still some people who say, yeah, they were famous for a 20-mile radius outside of New York. I don't think that's true. No. People like Robert Benchley were very, they're not read at all today. I'm sure all of his books are out of print. It's the kind of humor we don't get anymore. And you said it was wisecracking as a performance art form. Yes, yeah. that's the round table kind of thing. And you know, the round table only lasted for a few, these things are very generational. Mm -hmm. They only last for a few years. In fact, Ferber at one point, you know, she'd been quarreling with everybody because she was, let's put it mildly, quarrelsome. <laughs> and she decided to make, the, make it all up, you know, one fell swoop. I'll go to the Algonquin and lunch and I'll make, I'll make it up with everybody at the table. She went in and there was just a tourist family from, I don't know, Iowa at the table because the Algonquin had broken up. It was just, it, had, it had run its, it, not that the guys had all you know, died or anything, they were still around. Mm -hmm. And they, they started dying in the 1940s, the 1950s. I think Dorothy Parker was the last of them all. But the fact is that these names, even if you have never read a word they've written, they're summoning terms for a certain kind of thing. It seems that everything starts in 1919, that the whole world just changes. After History the books, war. Yes, yeah. but it, it's like a magical year. And of course, the Algonquin Roundtable started sort of 1919, 1920. No one really is certain exactly you know, how it began. But, but the, the idea is that from then on, there was uh, the George S. Kaufman, there's Dorothy Parker, there's Ferber, there are all these people who, for the most part, are the offspring of immigrants. Their parents were too busy just learning English right. to do anything like And were this. poor and living in tenements. Exactly. It was yeah. all about survival for them. Yeah. But yeah. for their kids, it's about showing off and it's about, I am American, so I don't have to you know, work at it. And I'm looking at the world and I'm observing it. And these Protestants just don't know what they are. They're so they boring. Need me to tell, <laughs> well, they need me to tell them kind of thing. Because they, they think they're the, the default you know, um, what is it, the default entry for humankind. Right. You know, they don't know anyone else is on this planet. They don't realize that we observe, which they don't, and so we can tell them what they're like, and we can write all our, our fiction about them, and we can make our jokes about them, and about ourselves as well. And moving all this stuff together, the, the Italian and, and, and the, the Jewish and the, um, the gay and the black, moving it all together is Broadway, is the column, eventually is television, it's, Ameri it's the American art scene. 
Mm. And it all started in, in these years, the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s. Now, this book is a series of profiles of, of fascinating people, people involved in this and people who were on the flip side sort of threatened by it, including one of the most interesting portraits of Charles Lindbergh I have read. Mm. And I must say that you revealed aspects of Lindbergh, the great aviator, character that I had not totally been aware of. I was somewhat aware, but not totally. But let's just say Lindbergh is the man who is against this yes, kind of yeah. totally. sophistication. Absolutely, yeah. yes. How, why and how does that come about? It, it has to do with his father, because he, he, um, he, he used to travel with his father on the campaigns, and they were, you know, two guys in a hotel room, well, father and son in a hotel room. They had nothing to do but talk, and all the senior Lindbergh would talk about was politics. Mm -hmm. and the House of Morgan, yeah. and the money interests, and so on. Oddly enough, by the way, the House of Morgan is where Lindbergh invested his money when he started to make it. <laughs> Just, uh, all right, that's what happens. <laughs> you, you turn over. But I, I think basically it's, he, it's not so much that he was against, let's say, the Algonquin Round Table, and I doubt no, he no, even no, knew who Dorothy Parker was. Or against Cole Porter. Or, but, yeah. but in the same way that, for instance, in the Battle of Gay Marriage, there's no famous person in favor of it and a famous person against it. It's, it's two different sides kind of thing. With Prohibition, which is another, I think, uprising of the, the, red sta uh, the red states against the blue states. There was no famous person who spoke for the wets and a famous one who spoke for the dries. But in the late 1930s, interventionism in the European war versus mm. um, right. isolationism, there was a he said, she said. He was Charles Lindbergh and she was Dorothy Thompson, who once was the second most famous woman in America and now is totally, totally forgotten. Totally forgotten. Tell us who Dorothy Thompson was for people who've forgotten her. Dorothy Thompson was the first woman pundit. Basically, she was now in those days, Republicans were not the way they are now. Republicans were completely different, and you could be a liberal Republican. There was such a thing. Dorothy Thompson was a liberal. And she was a Republican. reporter. She had been a reporter first, but now she became, and she had a radio show and as married well. married to Sinclair Lewis. Yes, she married a very, very famous American novelist, and they had a terrifically difficult marriage <laughs> yeah. because they were raging Sin alcoholics. Well, right? yes, he was a very difficult character. Yeah. Very, very difficult. And they're she not alive, sweetheart. so they can't sue But us. she and Lindbergh squared off over the whole this Yes, she became the, the voice of, the of interventionism. She was absolutely convinced, even at a time when the only other person, only other famous person in America who was also convinced was Walter Winchell, that the Nazis were endangered everybody, not just to Europe. They would eventually come after us. They had to be stopped. And he was a Nazi. Not a card-carrying Nazi, but that was the only difference. Franklin Roosevelt is my authority on this. He said to uh, Morgenthau, he said, if I die tomorrow, I want this known. I'm absolutely convinced that Charles Lindbergh is a Nazi. Really? So he stood for, intervention, uh, for isolationism, which didn't mean so much, we don't want to enter that war, as I want the Nazis to win. Well, and also, didn't he make comments about the Jewish problem? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, he, well, and Lindbergh would have seen New York as a place where all the Jews are. Exactly. I mean, the Jewish problem. Germany yes. had a Jewish problem like it had a Wiener Schnitzel problem. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> there's no, and Dorothy Thompson said there's no such thing as the Jews. Right. Kind of thing. It's, there's no such thing as plumbers, school teachers, Methodists, which he was. But that's not what Lindbergh saw or was speaking no, about. No, he was, he was a great believer in, you know, a group I hate is everyone is the same. Mm. How interesting. Now, uh, this book takes us through sort of the these eras of sophistication in New York, and it all sort of... I don't know, reaches a climax and then ends with Truman Capote's famous ball. That Truman Capote, the, 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 the man who's bringing the gay culture now into this yes, mix Yes, and, of... and bringing all these famous people together. And of course, the book starts with, in the days of Mrs. Astor, it starts with balls. Right. And it ends with this incredible ball that everyone in the country knew about. In fact, Esquire ran a cover story like a year later with people like Ed Sullivan and Kim Novak and others, and they're all Tony Curtis. They're standing there like this on the cover and saying, we wouldn't have come to your ball if you had invited us. <laughs> I mean, it was the talk of the country, not just the talk of the town kind mm. of thing. And it's, it's a fitting end to the book because you, um, the advice by the great diva to the aspiring actress, when you exit, take everything with you, including the grand piano. <laughs> Truman Capote took everything with him. That ball was the end of New York sophistication. Why? Why did it end well, well, there are a lot of reasons, but uh, the culture was changing, and the infrastructure that supported um, uh, that kind of sophistication was um, falling away. For instance, the columns were gone. Win yeah. Walt Winchell was gone. He wasn't replaced by anyone that powerful. The, the nightclubs changed. were going too, right? The Copa, the Very Stork, much. all those places. The Stork especially. That kind of exclusive place that everyone wants, everyone wants to get into because he can't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's all gone because no one likes that anymore. I mean, there was Studio 54, but that wasn't the same thing at all. Kind mm -hmm. of, it, it wasn't as, as grand and glamorous. It didn't have um, the house perfume sortilege which Sherman Billingsley would present. That's right. Susan would be at her table, you know, with Michael, and, and there would be a signal kind of, he does this, which uh, 
I think this meant, God, this guy is a bore. Could you please tell him I'm summoned? Tell me I'm summoned on the phone. He had all kinds of signals to his his people, <laughs> but he also had um, ties to give to the men, uh, fountain pens, I think. And the great thing was sortilege perfume, which came in a box, because yeah. <laughs> there's a photograph in the book of Susan Hayward smiling, and she's got this <laughs> box of perfumes, a loaf of milk. You tell a fascinating story tying Josephine Baker to the end of the store club and the end in a certain sense of Walter Winchell's career. Yes, it all now, happened. What was that? It's all together. Josephine Baker and Roger Rico and his wife. Rico had taken over for Ezio Pinza in South Pacific. And Josephine Baker, everyone knows, but tell us who she was. Uh, she was a black diva. She uh, was. She's now famous only for one thing, which is dancing semi-nude. Um, wearing a, a cincture of bananas jungle and jesta, you know, Paris. bananas and yeah. so on. In, in, well, she went to Paris yeah. to make her career. She was much, much, much richer personality than that. First of all, she was a soprano when she sang, at least in her early years, which I find interesting. She was a movie star in France, and her dancing, which you can see on YouTube today, yeah, it has nothing to do with those bananas. It's yeah. a, she's a comic. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, she, yeah. She really, she's rubber band charming, and she uses her elbows yeah. and her bottom. She just loves to show you what fun she's having. It's not erotic at all. It's, it's really charming. It's enchanting kind of thing. So how did she, how did she? Well, she was making her comeback. Yes. But she was doing very, very well. And she and the Ricos and uh, another black woman whose name I forget. She was a politician. Yes, and that's, she was the one that engineered yes. this because she wanted to make herself famous. And she knew that the store club would make trouble. Now the store, Josephine Baker was too big to be turned away. The store club did have a color bar to a certain extent. Lena Horne got in, but if you were darker skinned kind of mm. thing, they, they drew the line. A lot of black people just never wanted to try it. It was just too unpleasant. In any case, it was that typical after theater dinner where everyone in the store club gets lousy service. But Josephine Baker decided, it's probably me kind of thing. It's really not clear to this day whether she was being stiffed or whether it was just the typical store club service. The point is, Winchell was in the club at the mm -hmm. night, but he left early. They waved to each other because he was a big... He, he was a big Josephine Baker fan. He loved her, and uh, up till this night, actually. Right. And she decided to make... The food just came too late. She stormed out, and she decided it wasn't going to end here at the prodding of her political friend. And she decided it wasn't as interesting to get mad at the store club because... Let's face it, the Red State does have other things to worry about than the store club, but Winchell is so famous. Let's make it about Winchell. So it became a war on Winchell, but it wasn't just Josephine Baker, because Winchell was so hated by them, right. by everybody. The New York Post started to do a multi-series. You'd open up the Post and you'd think, oh my gosh, they're still at it. It was I've actually forever. seen that series in the morgue months at the, at the Post. Yeah. Of course, a takedown on what Winchell they piece. exposed, we all know about now, but no one knew it then. For yeah. instance, the idea that he didn't write his own column. Yeah. He created it, but yeah. then he had um, Herman, his uh, faithful <laughs> Herman secretary, wrote it. Herman wrote it. kind of thing. So, all these things were coming out, and the fact, my theory is that everyone was sick of Winchell anyway. He had made so many enemies in New York, you know, other columnists, but also p publicity men, all the people he had uh, had belittled kind of thing, all the people he'd frozen out of his column. Now, Move would, him would, along. would our friend Jean-Claude Baker, who was one of Josephine Baker's adopted children and runs Shay Josephine, yeah. would he agree with you that this was Josephine Baker's plot going in to, 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 to test whether or not she would be discriminated he against? He, he, he does. I, I was going to say, wait, he's, he's... He wrote a book. He has, he has yeah. a very interesting yeah. book about yeah. his mother. He believes she was, as many people do, she was absolutely wonderful and so impossible. And there are a lot of people in showbiz like that kind right. of thing. So it's hard really to know. Certainly her political friend had it in yeah. mind. Okay. I imagine she took Josephine into her confidence, but she might not have. Right. She might have thought, I'll let matters take their course. We have one minute. Yes, uh, uh, the book, uh, as you can see, ranges. Um, uh, but it ends in the 60s, as you said, with Truman Capote's It ends ball, with the ball. As, as the final thing. And yet still the notion of the guest list, of exclusivity, still still pervades, you know. You go to the clubs where all the kids do, there's still a rope line. Yes, that's true. And there's true. still kids <laughs> desperate to get into a yes, place they can't not, get into. Yes, but the people who get in are not anymore the buzz terms in American culture. They're, they're very famous. They're, they're, they're the Jersey cast of Jersey There are other sure. kids. Yes, but, exactly. Do you find New York still to be a sophisticated city? New sure. York today? Yes. With its Applebee's and its Disney yes. and its... Well, sophisticated doesn't mean it's only sophisticated. What kind of city would that be? It would yeah. be so strange. Everyone would sleep till four in the afternoon. Oh, why? Well, I you want know, to live in a store get, club. You couldn't get to the grocery store. <laughs> You're, but you consider you you consider that New York still has retained an air of sophistication. Absolutely. Mm. Yes, and, you, and darling, you're the one that's hanging out at Bar Centrale and and and, and hobnobbing with the with the elites. You I don't know. know I, it's still I, there. I, I wish it were just a black and white Fred Astaire oh. movie. The that, that to me that to me is the 
is the image of New York <laughs> sophistication. <right>. Yeah. <laughs> and there's still people out, there, people out there who hate us, Susan. Me Talk for elite. yourself. Talk for yourself. <laughs> All, right, All right, Ethan, it's a fascinating book, The Guest List, How Manhattan Defined American Sophistication from the Algonquin Roundtable to Truman Capote's Ball, out from St. Martin's Press. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you for having me. We'll see you soon, I hope. I'll throw you out of a club. <laughs> <laughs> Read it in my column. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get that sleeper? Oh, jeepers, creepers, where'd you get that smile? Gosh, go get it, how'd you get so lit up? Gosh, go get up, how'd you get that smile? How'd you get that smile? Oh! Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>